In our lesson today, we're getting back to our series on 1 Peter. And as we go through this book, what we've been noticing is that Peter is writing about what he described at the end of the letter as the true grace of God. He said there in 1 Peter 5 and verse 12 that this is the true grace of God. The things that he was writing, that constituted the true grace of God. Now we talk about grace and we have these, this idea, we understand the concept that grace is something that is a gift. Grace is what we receive from God that is undeserved. But in practical terms, what does that look like? How is grace manifested in our life? Well, as Peter's writing here about the true grace of God, he helps explain that to us, what this looks like in our lives. And so as we continue this series, today we're going to be looking at the first part of 1 Peter chapter 3. And there are several points we're going to notice here about what this true grace looks like. So we're going to begin by reading these verses. 1 Peter chapter 3, we're going to be looking at verses 1 through 12. So Peter says here, In the same way, you wives be submissive to your own husbands, so that even if any of them are disobedient to the word, they may be won without a word by the behavior of their wives, as they observe your chaste and respectful behavior. Your adornment must not merely be external, braiding the hair and wearing gold jewelry or putting on dresses, but let it be the hidden person of the heart, with the imperishable quality of a gentle and quiet spirit, which is precious in the sight of God. For in the same way, the form, in former times, the holy women also, who hoped in God, used to adorn themselves, being submissive to their own husbands, just as Sarah obeyed Abraham, calling him Lord. And you have become her children if you do what is right without being frightened by any fear. You husbands, in the same way, live with your wives in an understanding way, as with someone weaker since she is a woman, and show her honor as a fellow heir of the grace of life, so that your prayers will not be hindered. To sum up, all of you be harmonious, sympathetic, brotherly, kind-hearted, and humble in spirit, not returning evil for evil or insult for insult, but giving a blessing instead, for you were called for the very purpose that you might inherit a blessing. For the one who desires life, to love and see good days, must keep his tongue from evil and his lips from speaking deceit. He must turn away from evil and do good. He must seek peace and pursue it. For the eyes of the Lord are toward the righteous and his ears attend to their prayer. But the face of the Lord is against those who do evil. Several things we see here, and there are some things that we could get into a lot of discussion on, but we're going to kind of summarize what Peter is describing here. Again, all of this is under the heading of the true grace of God. So what is it that Peter says here? The first thing that we see that he gives instructions for wives here in these verses. He tells them in verse 1, wives be submissive to your own husbands. That this is referring to a role that we have. This is not, as Peter's saying this, this is not by telling wives to be submissive to their husbands, permission for the husbands to mistreat them or to disregard their wives or simply to do whatever they want to do. That's not what this is about. We're going to see that especially when we see what he writes to the husbands. But what he's talking about here are the roles that they have as God designed marriage to work in God's arrangement. The husbands and wives have different roles. And so he instructs the wives, be submissive to your husbands. However, as he writes to them, be submissive to your husbands. He's reminding them that you also have a higher authority over, even that's even over your husband. He has a higher authority that is over him. So don't just think if you're a wife that, well, whatever my husband does, whatever he thinks, whatever he says, that must be right. No, he says, be submissive to your husbands, but... He says, if any of them are disobedient to the words, not every husband is what he ought to be. Not every husband is following the Lord as he should. So if any of this, them are disobedient to the word, he says, they may be one without a word 
by the behavior of their wives as they observe your chaste and respectful behavior. The wives, even though they're in this role of, of being in submission, they still have an influence. They are still able to influence even their husband for good. So he says they are to be able to observe your chaste and respectful behavior. So this submission that he's talking about, submit to your husbands, first you submit to God. That chaste and respectful behavior is focusing on their response to God. Put God first. And as you put God first, fulfill that role that he has given you in that marriage arrangement. Then the second point that we want to notice here, before we get to talking about the husbands, The second point that Peter mentions in these verses is a reminder that God judges our hearts. Many people judge themselves based upon outward appearances. And the reason why we tend to do that, why we're tempted to do that, is because that's how others judge us. Others will judge us based upon what we look like, the way that we dress, how we present ourselves. Other people pass judgments against us because of these things. And so we're tempted to do the same thing. Now, in this context, he's directing this to the wives, but really the men need to hear this too, because this could be a this could be something where they are influenced to judge themselves based on what they look like, what they are wearing, and all these sorts of things. But he tells them here in verse three, your adornment must not be merely external braiding the hair, wearing gold jewelry, or putting on dresses. Don't think about these superficial things as being what gives you your worth. That's not how you are judged. We don't need to be burdened by other people's opinion about us, thinking that, well, we need to look a certain way because we want others to think about us a certain way. God's releasing us from that. I'd say you don't have to focus on that. He says there in in verse 4, rather than thinking that you are going to be judged or you ought to be judged based on what you look like, he says in verse 4, let it be the hidden person of the heart with the imperishable quality of a gentle and quiet spirit. Why? Why focus on character rather than your clothes, rather than what your hair looks like, rather than what people think of you? Focus on your character. Why? Why? He says at the end of verse 4, this is precious in the sight of God. God sees our heart. And whether he's talking to the women as his context is talking about or to the men as the principle extends to all of us, God sees our heart. We don't need to be burdened by what other people think about us and think that we need to look a certain way or dress a certain way because we want others to judge us favorably by their standards. God sees us. God sees our heart. And we can focus on that and make sure we're pleasing to him without feeling the the need to submit to what other people, how other people want to judge us and determine whether we are worth something or not because of what we look like or because of the clothes that we wear. So then the third point that we want to look at here in these verses. We've talked about instructions for wives here at the beginning, but then Peter gets into some instructions for the husbands. He said there in verse 7, you husbands in the same way live with your wives in an understanding way, as with someone weaker since she is a woman, and show her honor as a fellow heir of the grace of life so that your prayers will not be hindered. We talked about We mentioned briefly when we looked at the instruction for the women to be submissive to your husbands, we mentioned that this was not a license for the husband simply to do whatever he wants to do and disregard the feelings or the needs or the thoughts of his wife. Rather, a husband who is fulfilling the role that God has given to him. Peter says here, you are to dwell with your wife in an understanding way. Pay attention to her needs, to her feelings. Make sure that she is respected and she is honored. He says there in in that verse, show her honor as a fellow heir of the grace of life. If she's not a second-class citizen in the kingdom of God because she's a woman, 
She is equal with you. She is a fellow heir of the grace of life. So treat her with honor. Now, he mentions there, dwell with her in an understanding way. Try to understand her. See what she needs. See what her thoughts are. Listen to her. Dwell with her in an understanding way. He says that you do this as with someone who is weaker. Now, when we read that, we might immediately think that this is talking about physical strength because generally men are stronger than women, but that's not what he's talking about here. He's not talking about physical strength. He's talking about, you think about dishes and how those are made. And you might have a bowl that is made of plastic and you can drop it, you can throw it around and nothing's going to happen to it. And then you have another bowl that's made of fine china. That This is something that is more valuable, something that is more precious. It's also something that you have to take care of because it is something that can break. Now, he's not talking about the physical strength of the woman versus the man. That's not the point. His point is how you treat this. You treat the one dish better than the other because it is more valuable. You treat her as if she is more valuable. You treat her with honor. You take care of her. You make sure nothing happens to her. You don't disregard her and think that, well, she's not important because she's a woman or I'm the head she's to submit to me so what I think is important no you treat her with honor you dwell with her in an understanding way you treat her with respect because of who she is and as Peter explains this he says something interesting there at the end of that verse you treat her in this way as a fellow heir of the grace of life so that your prayers will not be hindered Peter is explaining here the need for husbands to treat their wives in a way that honors them and by doing that also honors God who created this marriage arrangement. He says, if you don't do this, your prayers are going to be hindered. Why would our prayers be hindered? Because God will not be pleased with how we are treating her. God expects us as husbands to treat our wives well and not think that we can just disregard them because, well, we are the head of the house. That's not how it works. We don't treat our wives in a poor way and think that God's going to just be okay with that. We don't want our prayers to be hindered, so we treat our wife with an understanding, in an understanding way, treat her with honor, recognize she is equal to us, fellow heirs of the grace of life. So with both husbands and wives, as he's giving instructions to both, he is describing how as each one of them fulfill this role, you're going to have peace and harmony in the home, that the marriage is going to be better than it would if both spouses or one of the spouses just disregarded all of these things. God is giving us the way to have a good, healthy, and happy marriage and a happy home. Then the fourth point that Peter talks about here is that he gives a plan for us to see good days. He says there in verse 8, sum everything up. And this is where we could really talk about a lot of different things. And we're going to kind of move through this a little bit quickly. But he says to sum everything up, all of you be harmonious, sympathetic, brotherly, kind-hearted, and humble in spirit, not returning evil for evil or insult for insult, but giving a blessing instead For you were called for this purpose that you might inherit a blessing. He's saying you treat others well. This is essentially fulfilling the golden rule as Jesus talked about in Matthew chapter 7 and verse 12. That you treat others the way that you want them to treat you. We are to treat others in a way that shows honor and respect for them. That you do what is good. You act in a brotherly way toward them. You be kind to others. You act with humility because that's how we would want others to treat us. So treat others well. Then he says in the next verses that you are to be honest. The one who desires life to love and see good days. We want to see good days. We want to have a good life here. So what do we do? Keep our tongue from evil. Keep your lips from speaking to see. Be honest with other people. He says, turn away from evil and do good. Keep yourself from sin. 
do what is right, keep God's commandments, do good to other people. And then he says that we are to pursue peace. The end of verse 11, he must seek peace and pursue it. So God, as he gives us instructions in his word, shows us how we can see good days, treat others well, be honest, do good, seek peace. If we do these things, and this is up to us, this is our responsibility, as we do that, we will see good days here. And then the fifth and final point that we're going to talk about here today, what Peter mentions in these verses, is that he reminds us that God sees the righteous. Verse 12, he said, For the eyes of the Lord are toward the righteous, and his ears attend to their prayers, but the face of the Lord is against those who do evil. Sometimes we wonder if, as we try to do what's good and what's right, we try to do what we ought to do, we wonder if anyone really notices what we're doing. God does notice. Other people may not. Other people may ignore what we're doing. They may take it for granted. God sees what we're doing. Our efforts to, to please him, to do what is right, they're noticed by him. And he goes on and says that his ears attend to their prayers. He is aware of us. He is concerned about us. He is listening to us. We have that assurance. Maybe other people ignore us. Maybe we feel like we're being neglected and overlooked. That may happen. God sees us. God notices us. If we are striving to do what is right, God sees us. But then he says his the face of the Lord is against those who do evil. He notices those who do right, and he notices those who don't. We need to make sure that we are on the right side. Keep ourselves from sin. Make sure we are doing what is good, and he's shown us how to do that in his word. So as we look at these verses, again, Peter is talking about the true grace of God. And as we follow his instructions, we are recipients of the blessings that he gives, the grace that he offers, because it leads to peace in the home. As husbands and wives working together are treating one another with respect and with honor and according to God's instructions as he has given, we have peace of mind, we have peace with others, and we have the assurance that God sees us, that God is always there and caring for us, that as we try to please him, our efforts don't go unnoticed. This is the true grace of God. As we follow God and we try to do his will, it leads to good days here. We may still face trouble. We will have difficulties in this life. But our life is far better when we follow the Lord. And the reason why it's better, despite whatever difficulties we may face here, is because we know God is with us. God sees us, and we have, as we've seen already in this study of 1 Peter, we have hope. So let's focus on serving him and doing his will, whatever role that we have, whatever situation we find ourselves in. Let's make sure we're doing what is right, because God sees us, and in the end, God will reward us.